So, uh, first of all, I would like uh, to uh, thank uh, Professor Maurice de Gosson for accepting the invitation to our uh, seminar and also uh, thank the other uh, attendees. First of all, I want to make a quick introduction of uh, Professor de Gosson, who uh, now he is in, in Vienna. So as you can uh, see on slide, uh, I can read something from uh, his, how he introduced uh, his uh, expertise, which uh, is uh, related to the harmonic analysis and the geometry in symplectic spaces. And also uh, you have said that it's one of your uh, hobbies, which uh, I know that it's more than hobbies uh, to, uh, study the foundational questions in quantum mechanics. And uh, okay, I'm not a specialist to understand what it is, but uh, there is um, the approach of uh, symplectic, especially the approach of symplectic camel. And uh, in general, the epistemological and the ontological questions of uh, quantum mechanics. So there are some philosophy also. Uh, going on, I think, in your interest, Professor. And also, I I want to uh, to mention also that uh, uh, Professor had has many uh, publications and uh, published also some books. I want to mention the one, the last one uh, was in 2011 on symplectic methods in harmonic analysis and applications to mathematical physics. So uh, the talk of today's talk is on the notions of mixed Gaussian quantum states and uh, density operators. So you have the floor, Professor. You can mention more about uh, the general aspect of uh, this talk, and uh, you, you have all the floor. Okay. Thank you, Iman, very much for your <laughs> nice and kind presentation. All right. Uh, the talk I'm going to give today is an extended and hopefully improved version of a talk I gave at Sorbonne uh, University in last July at a, at a conference. So it was approximately the same topic, but there are some new results which I have added here. So it's fresh out of the oven. <laughs> okay, so let's go. So what is a quantum state? Well, following Wikipedia, it's a mathematical entity that provides a probability distribution for the outcomes of each possible measurement on a system. Uh, okay, that sounds a little bit uh, mm, abstract and obscure. The, a quantum state is a fundamental object. It's the fundamental object which describes quantum mechanics. And as such, it is a fundamental object this, that is being studied in quantum mechanics. So in this talk, I will make this definition more precise and apply it to a class of states which can be viewed as the building blocks of quantum theory. Those who are Gaussian states. Uh, these generalize the coherent states introduced by Erwin Schrödinger in 1926. So much, as, as Iman said, much philosophy and ontology is indirectly involved. I will not discuss such issues in this talk because, uh, I mean, ontology and foundations of quantum physics is a hobby for me. And you should be extremely careful when you discuss with people, especially physicists, about these issues, because you will automatically dissatisfy almost everyone. And, well, as Richard Feynman, Richard Feynman was a famous American physicist, got the Nobel Prize, he said that philosophy of science is about as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. <laughs> well, of course, maybe he was exaggerating a little bit because actually birds can need ornithologists. But still, uh, still, it's a, it's a really, uh, I mean, ontological questions are really difficult to handle because nobody agrees on this. I know several philosophers of science and they all have diverging uh, points of view. So I'm avoiding this, but still it's interesting before just going to bed to read 
some philosophy or science or or some texts about about the interpretations of quantum mechanics. But my old teacher Jean Leray uh, used to say that ah, uh, autant de quantisation. Uh, yes, he said actually, actually, uh, uh, well, quantization is like a religion. You have many of them. Good. So actually, what is a quantum state? Well, a first a pure state is a non-zero element called a state vector in physics of some complex Hilbert space H. Usually, uh, this Hilbert space is taught, taken equal to L2 R n, the digital space of square integrable functions. So one could ask why a Hilbert space? Well, there are many reasons for this, but the principal reason for using a Hilbert space in quantum mechanics is that you can define orthogonal projections inside. And this is actually related to the problem of the collapse, so-called collapse of the wave function. Because when you make an observation, according to physicists, you, on a system represented by a certain wave function, you collapse this wave function. So it becomes something else. And this something else is the projection of the initial state on a Hilbert subspace. Well, I'm not going to uh, too much into the details here, because it would take too uh, long time. I think this is rather well known. Yeah. Okay, a mixed state. A mixed state is just a statistical melange of pure, pure states. It's a countable collection. Well, I'm saying here a countable collection. It does not necessarily have to be countable. You can also take a continent of uh, pure states. It's a stati statistical melange of weighted pure states, psi j, normalized to one by coefficients alpha j whose sum is equal to one. So it's a convex sum of pure state. And whereas one usually assumes that the psi j are normalized, that is that the L2 norm is equal to one, but this is only a technical requirement, of course, because you can always normalize to one any element in a Hilbert space. So for practical purposes, for instance, for the definition of the mean that is the average, and of the covariances, one usually assumes that the psi j, in addition, satisfies some adequate decay conditions at infinity because we want to integrate. This optimal choice is to assume that each psi j is the Schwarz space SRN, the Schwarz space of test functions of rapidly decreasing functions at infinity. For instance, you can assume that they are Gaussians. Of course, can also consider less extreme cases, but this rapidly leads to uh, functional difficulties of convergence and things like that. I will not too much talk about that. There's one optimal choice is to assume that each psi j is in a so-called modulation space. Uh, modulation spaces are functional spaces defined by Hans Feitinger uh, in the 1980s, but that's another question. So the density operator spectrum. Well, we can identify every mixed state in quantum mechanics with a density operator. Now, the density operator is defined as follows. It's a row hat. When I put a hat, I usually always mean an operator. Is the convex sum of the pi psi j's, where pi psi j is the orthogonal projection in L to our n on the ray uh, determined by psi j. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I also show that the, the, the physicist bracket, bracket notation, all you know, these strange things there. And uh, but I would avoid using it because the bracket notation, which is very, very commonly used in quantum mechanics, is misleading and uh, can lead to mathematical errors. It's very easy to use, but it's uh, it's deceptive. Actually. Good. So this operator row hat, as defined above, is a positive semi-definite trace class operator. Trace class operator. I assume that everybody knows more or less the definition of a trace class operator. It's a it's an operator who's a, who has a trace. <laughs> well, a little bit of you. and it is positive semi-definite. So this is actually the delicate point because usually given a certain operator is 
easy to determine whether it is or not a trace lab, but to determine positivity is much more difficult. I'll turn to that in a bit more. And we assume that this trace equal to one. Good. So <laughs> the fact that the trace of rho hat is equal to one is just a reflection of the fact that the sum of all probabilities alpha j should be equal to one. That's why we have this condition. So rho hat is a compact operator because trace class operators are compact. So you can apply the spectra theorem, which shows that hmm, there exists an sequence of orthonormal vectors phi j and a sequence lambda j of positive numbers, which are the eigenvalues of rho hat, such that the trace of rho hat is equal to one and such that we have the sun below. Be careful, uh, the sun below in the last line is not necessarily the same thing as the sun in the first formula of this slide. In the first formula of this slide, I did not make any assumption of orthogonality between uh, the psi j's. But it turns out that you can prove quite easily that a row had such defined, defined in this way is a trace class operator and hence has the uh, spectral decomposition written in the last line. Mm -hmm. uh, philosophically, it means that if you take an arbitrary collection of states, psi j, mm -hmm. and if you take the mixture of them, physically you cannot distinguish that mixture from the other mixture obtained by assuming that all the states are orthogonal. So you have a kind of indecidability in, in the theory of density operators. Uh, just, well, can I uh, can I interrupt, uh, yes. Professor? Just yes. uh, about the summation is uh, we have some information about the number uh, uh, numbers of elements in this summation between the two summations. Yeah, well, are the same or it can be no? It can be a finite number. It can be an infinite number. But of course, okay. the phi j's are not. I mean, uh, do not form a basis because that okay. would be too much. Then we would no longer have a uh, a uh, the trace class operator. Usually physicists assume that the sums are finite, but mathematically there's no reason to do so. Uh -huh. If you look at the spectral theorem for, for, for compact operators, you see that you have some requirements on the lambda j, uh, the zero is an accumulation point and so on and so on. But this is very classic. This is not physics here, it's really mathematics. Okay. Good. You. So. But well, this is illustrated by Jane's theorem. Uh, several different mixtures can lead to the same density, density operator, as I just said. We can start with an arbitrary mixture, and then using the spectral theorem, we can get uh, decomposition in terms of orthonormal factor. And Jane's theorem says that, okay, let's consider a mixed state and an orthonormal state. And let's write sine j equal to the sum over k of all the a j k's, phi k's. So the operator defined by a hat phi j equals the sum and so on and so on is a hit the split operator and, and is the density operator of the state psi j. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, rho hat is a density operator is clear because the product of two Hilbert split operators is a trace class operator. Class of and two mixed states psi j, lambda j, and psi prime j, number prime j, generate the same density matrix if and only if there exists a partial isometry u hat such that a hat is equal to a hat prime, u hat where a prime blah, blah, is defined in terms of. Okay, so this, the essence of Jane's theorem is that it doesn't matter. You can always replace a given mix of state by another one generating the same density order. Operator. If you of, of last slide, this is already the case if you take the spectral decomposition. Actually, to prove Jane's theorem, you make use of the spectral decomposition. So uh, below you have the reference for Jane's, uh, Jane's work. It's quite old already, 1957. He proved that in the case of finite mixed states. And I recently generalized that to the case of infinite uh, countable 
the internet money uh, mix of states here in June 2021. I think it's published now in uh, some paper. I, I don't remember, actually. So this is a basic theorem, and it's not often mentioned in the theory, but it's important, of course. So let's say the Wigner distribution of a density operator. I define this because I want to define the vile symbol of the density operator. So to a density operator rho hat, we associate a function rho, square integral function here, defined by, oh, it should be L2 in R2 and not then 3 Well, it's the same thing, of course. And this function is defined by formula one. It's just a convex sum of Wigner transforms of the Psi J's, where W Psi J is the Wigner transform of Psi J, defined by the formula you see below here. So there would be, of course, very much to say about, about the Wigner transform. It was introduced, I think, in 1936, if I remember well, by Eugene Wigner, who got the Nobel Prize, not only for that, but for other reasons here. And he was looking for a substitute for a probability then speaking quantum mechanics. That is, it turns out that W psi j is not always positive. It can take negative values. It's actually positive if and only if psi j is a Gaussian function here. In which case it can be then identified with a classical probability density. But the fact that the Wigner transform can take negative values is actually one of the of the key marks of quantum theory. You have negative probabilities, as physicists like to say. Yeah. So the theory above is convergent in L2, and, and, and its integral is equal to 1, provided that rho decreases sufficiently fast at infinity. Well, actually, I said, provided that rho is in one of the Schubert classes. It, it surfaces, once you know that you have uh, such a sum, it surfaces with a row in L1, but I'm not going to discuss all this because this will lead us to the refinements in the theory of chase test operators. And mm, the, the, the formula that you see there is very often used by physicists without justifications, and it's often false. But okay, we will assume that it holds that it's a the function rho is sufficiently nice, which is not always obvious because, I mean, if you take a convex sum of Wigner transforms, uh, even if you know very precisely what each Wigner transform is, it's not, it's not so evident that when you integrate rho, you can permute the summation sign and integration sign. You know as well as I do all the difficulties uh, when dealing with series. So, Schubert class. I mentioned Schubert class. What is a Schubert class? A Schubert class, gamma and delta, is the vector space of all C infinite functions on R to N, such that you have the estimates to be the middle here. So simply it means that, well, if we take delta equal to one, the, the functions A, Z have the behavior of the inverse of a polynomial, which is a nice condition, of course, of course, because it can be used to, to show con convergence or or to to tame uh, the Wigner transform as well. So a theorem is that the Wigner transfer distribution rho satisfies this condition if if rho belongs to a fighting on modulation space. Okay, I'm not commenting on that because I will not have uh, time to to do this here. Uh, the fighting spaces M1, S, R, N are nice functional spaces, just uh, allowing a convergence of the Wigner transform. It's a the theory of modulation spaces, it's a very active field of functional an analysis. It has many applications in signal theory, uh, time frequency analysis, and, uh, and functional analysis as well. Good. So this is only to be sure that we have nice objects here. So the vice symbol of the dynasty operator. So the Wigner distribution rho, which we just defined, is up to a factor, the vice symbol of rho hat. That is, we have rho hat equal to 
2 by x bar up to the n operator by rho. Equivalently, <clears throat> rho hat is an operator with distributional kernel given by formula four below here. Uh, formula four can often be rewritten as a Fourier integral as you see in, in, in formula five. Uh, for those who are not quite familiar with while operators, uh, formula, in the general case, of an operator A hat with Y symbol A, this formula would be replaced by A hat psi X equals to one over two pi X bar N, and then the integral with rho replaced by A. This is one of the most fundamental definitions in the theory of while operators uh, viewed as Fourier integral operators. Anyway, uh, it's a quantization formula. It's a formula which associates a certain function, a row here, an operator. So this is called in mathematics and physics as well a quantization procedure. But uh, talking about quantization procedures would deserve a, a talk for itself. So uh, I will not be able to say so much more. You see, in Formula 5, you have the one half of x plus y. So you have a mid-term here between x and y. And this is characteristic of vine quantization here. Because you could otherwise affect x and y of different weights, just summing up to one both of them. Then you, you get in trouble. Yeah. For instance, if you take a row of x only and p then, then you have the usual uh, Hermander pseudo differential calculus. Yeah. But it's not physically interesting because because it does not have enough symmetry. Yeah, just one, one thing here. Um, why is it important to use wide quantization? Just because wide quantization takes a real symbol into a self-adjoint operator. This is one of the great advantages in, in, uh, in quantization here. Yeah. Because mm, physicists want to consider real functions, which are classical observables, and they want to replace them by self-adjoint operators. And while quantization works very well, it's not the only quantization which works well. You have another scheme, which is called the Bond-Jordan quantization scheme, which is also very good. But again, that's another story. Good. So statistical interpretation, well, it's quite obvious. Well, as I said here, let A had to be a bounded operator on L2. Call it an observer, as physicists do. So the trace class operators forming a two-sided ideal L1 of B L2, we can define the average value of A hat in a mixed state with density operator rho hat by using formula six. So the average of A hat is defined by taking just the trace of rho hat times A hat here. So this formula is sometimes written by physicists as an integral of rho z, a z, d z, <laughs> even by some mathematicians. But when you do that, you should be very careful because you have convergence problems involved. And this formula can be false. That is, it can happen that the right-hand side converges, but does not give uh, the, the average value a hat rho. Yeah. So this is always to be taken with a grain of salt and one should be more than careful when writing things like that here. Good, yeah, as I say here at the end of the slides, the expressions are however in general mathematically meaningless. Unless again, you can assume that rho belongs to an adequate Schubin class. That is if you have fast decrease at infinity and you must also assume that A hat does not increase too fast at infinity, good. So this is, these are caveat lectures, all that, I mean, between things one is tempted to write and things which are true. Okay, so since, since we give a statistical interpretation of the density operators, we can define the covariance matrix. So we view rho, that is the Wigner distribution as a quasi-probability density on R2. Well, if it's positive, it's a quasi-probability density. It's a, sorry, it's a probability density. But as, as I said, the Wigner transform can take negative values, so rho is not always positive. The covariance matrix of the random variable 
big Z equal to X1, X1 up, and so on, is by definition the 2N, 2N matrix written in formula set. Uh, it's a symmetric matrix here, and it's defined by the integral you see there. Uh, observe that what you get here is a 2N times 2N matrix because the Z transpose come at the second place. Ah, it's a condensed way of writing that instead of writing it term wise. Uh, the Z between brackets here is just the mean value of the average value of Z. So, and a sufficient condition for the existence of sigma is again the row belongs to some Schubin class with n sufficiently small because then you will have convergence. So the covariance matrix, uh, the covariance matrix is a very classical object, well-known object from statistics, of course. Yeah, it's a it's a matrix representing representing all the variances and the covariances of a statistical phenomenon. Two sigma one associates the covariance ellipsoid. Yeah. What well, is defined in this way? This is one way to define the covariance ellipsoid. It's not the only one, but I like this one because it makes us come closer than to the normal distributions. Observe that you have the inverse of the covariance matrix here. So you must assume here that sigma is invertible, but in quantum mechanics, it is always invertible. We're going to see why. If you replace the sigma minus one by sigma, you get the so-called information matrix. It also has another name. Uh, I don't remember it, but well, Information matrix. So let's proceed here. So the fundamental property of the quantum covariance matrix is the following. The covariance matrix of a density operator, rho hat, always satisfies the condition nine. Just nine. So what does this condition nine mean here? Uh, J, the big J here, I should have defined it uh, besides here, is the standard symplectic matrix. I'll write it in a moment in the other side. It's a block matrix which can be read as zero identity minus identity zero. <clears throat> H bar is Planck's constant H divided by two pi. No, don't worry, that's the H bar at any constant. By the way, Planck's constant is denoted by H. Why? <laughs> It's because Max Planck, the physicist who inferred the existence of this, had, he did not believe in, the, in, the, in its physical importance. So he called H the Schmidtgröße, which means uh, uh, auxiliary, uh, uh, auxiliary object or, or quantity. Therefore, the H. Yeah. And sigma is the covariance. So what does Dine mean? It, first, observe that. Sigma plus I H bar over two times J is a Hermitian matrix. Why? Because if you take the Hermitian conjugate, sigma will not leave because it's a symmetric matrix. I will re be replaced by minus I. And J star, which be minus J, as is easy to see immediately. See so all these eigenvalues, all the eigenvalues of Sigma plus i h bar over 2j will be real numbers. And the theorem says that, okay, if it's the covariance matrix of a quantum state, then all these eigenvalues must be positive or zero. Yeah. To prove that, it's not easy at all. It's, it looks like a little triviality, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, one thing here, I said that. It's a necessary condition for positivity. It's not a sufficient condition, except for Gaussian states. We'll talk more about that in a moment. It's very difficult to prove, and actually the proof, I, I referred to a paper of Nalkovich from, from 1990. It's based on the Casta lucas Mirafusol study of C-star algebras. So it, it's, <laughs> it's a complex procedure. Uh, it uses the a quantum version of the Bochner theorem, which I will uh, show in a moment here. Uh, my colleagues, Elena Cordero, <clears throat> Fabio Nicola, and myself have given a new proof of this 
in a sense, that sent the same approval this uh, a few years ago, it's published in, in advances in theoretical mathematical physics here. Yeah. But the proof is not quite simple either. It makes use of many, many tricks in functional analysis. Yeah. Uh, among other things, of a positivity lemma of sure. Good. So this condition here, that is the condition nine here, can be formulated in several different ways. First, it is equivalent to the existence of S in SPN. SPN is the symplectic group, that is the standard symplectic group, which is the group of all linear transformations which uh, keep the symplectic form invariant, such that S of the centered ball in phase space, the square root of h bar, is included in omega. Omega being the covariance. Actually. What does this mean? I mean, okay, we take a phase space ball with radius the square root of h bar, and we apply a symplectic matrix to it. So we will get an ellipsoid, which called a symplectic ball. And what this theorem says that, okay, the quantum condition sigma plus i h bar over 2j positive is satisfied if and only if the covariance ellipsoid omega contains such a symplectic ball. I have called such ellipsoids uh, quantum blobs in, in previous works. Uh, they can be viewed as the smallest phase based units allowed by the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. That is a long story, which is actually related to the principle of the symplectic camel, which is itself related to Gromov's non squeezing theorem. More about that in a moment. And this condition implies the uncertainty principle in a strong Gromov's on Schrodinger form. Uh, Formula 10 here is often written with delta xj and delta pj and so on in the physical literature. No. I'm writing here, to understand this, I'm writing here the covariance matrix in a block matrix form, sigma equal to sigma xx, sigma xp, and so on here, where sigma xx contains all the variances, sigma xp contains the covariances, and so on, and so on, and so on here. So this is a strong form of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In the usual Heisenberg uncertainty principle, people ne neglect the covariances sigma square xj pj. And then they take the delta xj's, who, uh, which are the square roots of the sigma xj equivalence. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is here a particular case of this. However, however, these Wobbets on Schrodinger inequalities are not sufficient to answer that. This is what I'm going to say here. Wait a minute, I go just a little bit forward. Uh, no. Yeah, well, here. Here's an example. Say that the uncertainty principle is a weaker statement than the condition sigma plus i h bar 2 over j positive. Uh, easy to uh, counter example here. Take the matrix sigma you see here there. So four times four matrix. You obviously have delta delta sigma x one. I should have it to stay con uh, consistent with my notation. They satisfy the orbit of the inequality. Actually, however, the matrix sigma is indefinite. It's not positive semi-definite here. But its determinant is equal to is negative, so it can certainly not be positive semi-indefinite. Well, Let's go back here. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So, uh, sorry, Professor. Just for uh, because there are some physicists. I'm not so sure if they are uh, familiar with the the vocabulary of uh, symplectic form in physics. What it measure? Uh, yeah. Well, it depends. If you if you talk to people working in quantum optics, for instance, mm. uh, they know very well the symplectic structure because they work with it, and uh, also, people working in quantum information theory. Now, for the others that we see here, oh, perhaps I should have. Had. Okay, mm, yeah, good. Here, here, here. Well, okay, an automorphism S in GL2 and R. 
that is an invertible matrix, if you read matrix you prefer, is symplectic if sigma is z, s z prime equal to sigma z z prime for all z z prime here. It can be reformulated as below. S is in SPN if and only if S transpose J S equals to J, where J is the standard symplectic matrix I mentioned. So the symplectic automorphism is from a group. Wow, it's easy to verify yeah. here. It's called the symplectic group. And it's one of the classical V groups. So it's a subgroup of G L to N R, of course, here. Uh, by the way, all the symplectic matrices have been turned into one. But the converse is not true, except in the case n equals one. Okay. Uh, there below you see two generators of the symplectic group. You have the V minus Ps, sometimes called symplectic shears, and you have the MLs there, which are rescaling operators. So you obtain a symplectic matrix by multiplying the V minus Ps, the MLs, and the matrix J and P by just scrambling all that. So all the symplectic matrices are generated from these here. Good. So uh, perhaps it's, uh, mm, okay, the quantum Bochner theorem, I'm going to avoid that because it's perhaps a little bit advanced here. So symplectic covariance, yeah. So here's the definition of the symplectic group. It turns out that the symplectic group has a unitary representation on L2 which is called the metaplectic group MPN. It, it means here that to every symplectic matrix, you can associate exactly two operators of L2 or N. These operators are called the metaplectic operators. They form a group, MPN, a covering group of SPN, actually. I denote by PMP, the projection, the covering projection, and MPN is generated by the unitary automorphisms A1, A2, A3 below. Oh, so you see, you have J hat, which is essentially the Fourier transform up to a factor. Uh, the factor you see there, it's uh, exponential of minus i n pi over four. It's called the GUI factor, G O U Y, because GUI did not work with the metaplectic group, but he was the one who noticed that you have a phase transition or a phase jump when dealing with optical rays. Then the V hat minus V is the metaplectic analog of the of the uh, symplectic shear here. It's just multiplication by a Gaussian here. Such kind of uh, Gaussians are called chirps in the language of time frequency analysis. And then the last one, which is a Risk, unitary rescaling operator. Of course, well, you have to do a lot of work to prove all this here. Uh, F yeah, is the usual unitary Fourier transform here. So I'm just concentrating very much on this because it's a difficult theory and uh, well, it would take several hours to develop all this here. Why do I present this here? It's because there's a very important property of wide characters which makes it so important also in quantum mechanics. If I take a continuous linear mapping from S prime to the, uh, to the space of linear operators that is continuous here, uh, S prime, that's the temporal distributions, uh, the, the dual space of the Schwarz space SRM here. Assume that A is just dependent on X here and that A applies L infinite into Rn here. Yeah. Then op A is multiplication by A x. If the operator corresponding to the compose A s minus one is obtained by conjugating the operator with symbol A with the corresponding metaplectic operators, then the operator must be a vile operator. At least, well, to put it <laughs> first, more simply, vile operators are the only operators which satisfies, which satisfy the symplectic covariance in the sense just indicated by the formula in the theorem. Mm -hmm. So the unique, well, the fact that they satisfy this covariance is not too difficult to prove. That prove to prove that they are the only operators is 
more technical. It was proved by uh, Elias Stein, uh, I think 20 or 25 years ago here. So perhaps this is a little bit technical, but it shows that the corresponding correspondence between Wigner distributions and density operator is symplectically covariant. That is, symplectic covariance is built inside quantum mechanics in its traditional form, at least here. Okay, so let's go over now, if I have time, yes, yes. Yeah. let's go over to Gaussian states. Okay, so consider the phase space distribution, you see that 30 degrees, just a normal probability distribution. But it can also be, be viewed as a quantum distribution, provided that the quantum conditions sigma plus i h bar over 2j positive is satisfied. So remember, I said that this condition is necessary for, a, for an operator, a trespass operator, to be a density operator. For Gaussians, it's necessary and sufficient. It makes the Gaussian, uh, uh, Gaussian states very pleasant to deal with, of course, here. Yeah. Okay, the proof <clears throat> is given in the same paper by Narkovich I mentioned a moment ago, and a new proof, in a sense, simpler was given also by myself and my collaborators in 2009. You can also find it in the, my 2021 book here, which uh, I detailed all that. Then you define the purity of the Gaussian state. You can actually define the purity of an arbitrary density operator. It's, by definition, the trace of rho hat squared. And you, it's easy to show that the state is pure if and only if the trace of rho hat squared is equal to one, which motivates the terminology purity. That's so out that. If you make the calculations, you see that in the case of, of uh, Gaussian states, the trace of rho f squared, that is the purity is given by the formula, you see that h bar over 2n determined of sigma minus 1 here. Good. So that's just two definitions here. So pure Gaussian states are on the wonder, but what, what are these pure Gaussian states? Well, you can show that the most general normalized, L2 normalized, pure Gaussian state is of the type psi phi xy, as you see there. Exponential of i phi, that's, you can forget it, just a innocuous phase factor, constant phase factor. Then you have constant 1 over pH bar n over 4, and then you have the exponential. So you see, you have a you have um, a complex exponential, but but the x is positive definitely, which makes all this then uh, uh, convergent here if you integrate. And both x and y are symmetric matrices, and phi uh, just a phase. The Wigner transform of such states is particularly simple. If you do the calculations. It's a little bit boresome, but not very difficult. You find that the Wigner transform of psi phi is equal to pi h bar minus n times a simple exponential, where the g, the matrix g up here, is given by the formula 14 there. And it's not really obvious, but this is a symmetric, symplectic matrix. Hallelujah. This makes things really very nice here. You know, see here, the simplicity automatically uh, comes when we deal with Gaussian states here. You see, everything is simplectic in quantum mechanics almost here. So how do you see that? Well, actually, you can factorize this G or you can verify that G satisfies the definition of a symplectic matrix. Anyway, this is the case here. And this, also gives a formula for the covariance matrix, since G is equal to H bar over two sigma minus one here. And, 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 yes. Okay, I'm not going to insist here on that. Uh, the metaplectic group acts transitively on Gaussian states. But if you take, for instance, the Fourier transform of the Gaussian state, you will get another Gaussian state. More general, if you take a metaplectic operator, 
yeah, and apply it to a uh, Gaussian state, you will again get a Gaussian state. There are very precise formulas from that and all that. So you, you can say that the metaplectic group acts uh, actually transitively on the manifold of all Gaussian states. Uh, observe that I'm only considering Gaussian states centered at the origin. You can also translate them. It does not make the theory much more difficult. Okay, so the multiple meanings of the quantum condition, I already talked about this a moment ago. If, okay, unfortunately, I didn't notice that I used the, the notation delta instead, instead of the, the small sigmas here for the covariances and that. But still, anyway, here you have this rewritten again here. The proof that we get the Robeson-Schrödinger uncertainty principle is easy, just linear algebra. Oh, you just discussed the principal minors of the matrix here. A counter example, we saw that a moment ago, you can have a covariance matrix satisfying the uncertainty principle, but which is still not quantum here. Yeah. Yeah. And again, okay, here's a technical proof of, uh, of, of uh, uh, quantum condition. Yeah, okay, say a few words if you guys still have a few minutes, I think, here. Yeah. Coming back to the covariance matrix here and to the ball, face space ball with square root h bar. Uh, yeah, the condition sigma plus i h bar over 2j positive is equivalent to the existence of s such that blah, blah, blah. We already talked about that. But this property can be reformulated by saying that the symplectic capacity of omega is at least by h bar. Symplectic capacity here is defined by the formula you see here in the theory. And it's not obvious, but what is a symplectic capacity? Well, mm -hmm. let me just make quickly a detour here by talking about global symplectic non squeezing theorem. Mm -hmm. The definition of the notion of symplectic capacity goes back to Ekel and Hofer, follows from Gromov's symplectic non squeezing theorem, which says the following. Let's take a phase space ball with radius small r and a phase space cylinder with radius big r defined by xj squared plus pj squared smaller than r squared, where j is some, some index of pairs of coordinates. If we can find a symplectomorphism. What is a symplectomorphism? It's what physics is called a canonical transformation. It's a diffeomorphism whose Jacobian is a symplectic matrix at every point here. If we can find such a symplectomorphism, such which sends the ball, which squeezes the ball inside the cylinder, then we must have small r, smaller or equal than to r. This means that you cannot use symplectic transformations to squeeze big balls into a symplectic cylinder. Uh, if you use simply volume preserving diffeomorphism, you can do it. Think about, uh, about the Uvitz theorem. You can take a big, 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 big ball and you can compress it to a soft edge and enter it in any cylinder. But if you have symplectic transformation, which are indeed also volume preserving, you cannot do that. So this is called the symplectic rigidity. And it was proved by Mikhail Gromov in Inventionis Mathematical in 85. And Gromov's theorem really is the main theorem of symplectic topology here. It has given many, many developments. It's very hard to prove. And actually, well, Gromov got the Abel Prize a few years ago, which is the, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in, in mathematics, among other things for this theorem here. So Gromov's theorem is also called the principle of the symplectic canon. Because why is it called the the camel, yeah, you know the proverb. It's easier. It's easier for uh, uh, for, for It's easier to have to pass a camel through a needle's hole than for a rich man to go to heaven. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. So this is a, yeah, uh, yeah, good. So this is a very important theorem, and wow. this theorem allows the definition of the notion of symplectic capacity I used in the theorem, which is here. 
but again, I have no time to develop all this here. Uh, then quantum polar duality, this is a very new thing I'm doing right now. I'm using the notion of polarity, which is defined by formula 16 there. You take a subset of Rn and you find it's polar dual like this. So the polar dual is a kind of Fourier transform, of set Fourier transform here. And it turns out theorem that the uncertainty principle can be formulated using notion of quantum polarity. And this, this view certainly has a brilliant future, I hope at least here. Well, it says that the quantum system localized in the position representation cannot be localized in the momentum representation as it's smaller than it's smaller. Okay, it smells very much like the the, like the, the uncertain principle, and it's also related to the principle of the symplectic camel, but no, I will not have time to talk about that. And entanglement, I will not have time to talk about that, and disentanglement, and so on. Sorry, I was a little bit slow for all this here. So mm -hmm. thank you for your very kind attention. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, Professor, you have some, uh, okay. In any case, if you want to talk uh, more about something, because uh, there is some 10 minutes if you, you want to add, but... Well, well yes, I can. Well, thank you. Then mm -hmm. I can quickly say something about entanglement here. So entanglement, mm -hmm. perhaps you have heard the word. Uh, it's following Asha Pérez. Asha Pérez was a famous physicist. It's a trick that quantum magicians used to produce phenomena that cannot be initiated by classical magicians. Well, it's what's said here. Uh, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. An entangled wave function does not describe the physical reality in a complete way. Uh, they were wrong, by the way, as is known today. Here in Schrödinger, for an entangled state, the best possible knowledge of the whole does not include the best possible knowledge of its parts. John Bell, which made a significant, significant advance uh, 30 years ago, it's a correlation that is stronger than any classical correlation. And Charles Bennett is a resource that enables quantum teleportation. Uh, tele quantum teleportation is not magical at all. It has been performed already for so, so 10 years, so 30 years ago by yeah. one of my colleagues, Anton Seidinger, here at the University of Vienna. What is it? So let's take a bipartite system. Bipartite system consisting of two parts, A and B. Hmm? One part A, A and one part B. With respective Hilbert spaces. Mm -hmm. Here, so the total system has dimension N, sum of an A and B. But we say that the density operator rho hat is AB separable. If there exist sequences of density operators in L2 RNA and in L2 R and B, and numbers summing up to one, such that rho hat is the sum of tensor products here. Uh, separable, it means that each, each component actually can be written as a tensor product. So this, you can delocalize the part A and delocalize the part B. If this is not possible, if you cannot do that for any decomposition, then the state is said to be entangled. And if you cannot do this, it means that you have hidden correlations. It, the definition is not easy to understand. So just take it like a mathematical definition. Yeah. Hmm. You can even generalize that to uh, do the continuous case, but I will not attempt to do it here. Or you can also define entanglement and separability for multi-partite states. Ah, we have more than two, two parts involved and so on. Good. So the only thing, well, one of the only things well known today are the PPT criterion and then another one I will show you in a moment. But take a density operator rho hat on L2RN. Suppose it is AB separable. Then the partially transposed operator rho hat TB that is where transposing with respect to the part B is also a density operator. Now, it's not difficult to prove it, but as simple as it seems, 
it has proven very useful. That is, hmm, the state is still separable. That is, if you switch by transposing one part of it, and if you get again a system, a quantum system here, it's hard to convey the, the really substance the really substance of this condition, but it's the oldest condition already known for 28 years now. It's almost trivial, but useful. Then uh, it's also sufficient in the case where the product of the dimensions is smaller or equal to six. Otherwise, it's not sufficient. <laughs> now we are also at the Werner Wolf Serapini condition. One of the most useful is the following a Gaussian state with covariance with sigma is separable if and only if there exist two partial covariance matrices of sigma A for the system A and sigma B for the system B, satisfy the quantum conditions, of course, now nah, we want to have quantum subsystems, and such that formula 19 holds here. Well, <clears throat> that's the Leuven partial ordering. It means that the eigenvalues of sigma are larger or equal to the sum of the, the of the, um, well, okay, the eigenvalues of sigma. It's again, uh, necessary condition in general, except for Gaussian. In Gaussian, it's really it's a sufficient necessary. But otherwise, it's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. And this is actually very depressing. We have two necessary conditions, this one and the PPT. But a uh, sufficient condition in the general case is still lacking. And this is part of very active research. I'm myself working on that. It's not simple at all. You can try to go around this and then try to find counter examples, but this is depressing but because we do not see really what, you see, conditions on the covariance matrix are not enough because the covariance matrix only characterizes the state in the Gaussian case. Otherwise, in a non-Gaussian case, you can have several different states having the same covariance matrix. So you must go beyond the covariance matrix and find something something different. Well, the first step perhaps to this is given in one of my recent papers, but it's not sufficient anyway, where I show that any density operators uh, can be disentangled in the sense of all by using unitary uh, mappings. And there uh, Metaplectic counterparts, mm. but um, well, the result is interesting, but it's not sufficient here. So for the proof, a lot of things. Uh, yeah. Oh, then of course you also have partial tracing when you have a composite system, a system component of A and B. Then you have a unique mapping called the partial tracing, which takes the partial trace of one of the two systems with respect to the other. These are technicalities here, but the interesting point is the one in the theorem here. That is the Wigner distribution of the subsystem A is obtained by integrating the Wigner distribution of the total system with respect to the system B here. It seems rather obvious. Well, you still have to, to prove it here. And uh, as a corollary, we have a purely mathematical corollary here. That is, if we take a function in the fighting space, moderation space M1S, or in some space of function decreasing quickly here, then you can find functions psi j a in the same space such that the integral here of the Wigner transform is equal to a convex sum of these functions psi and g. Well, it's a technical result, perhaps not to be too enthusiastic about it. It's just a way to hide the difficulties we have with partial subsystems and the entanglement theory, which is really a mysterious, uh, mysterious thing. I mean, well, the, the guy who first finds a sufficient condition for uh, entanglement uh, or for separability, which must have said that, uh, then he will become instantly famous. Mm. Okay, now thank you for your kind attention. Okay.
I think it's. Uh, you know, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for the thank you, thank you. talk. Thank and, you. Uh, um, so I will open the floor for questions if you, if it is. Sure, 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 sure. of course. Is there any question? Okay, uh, thank you. There is some uh, message on the chat. Okay. Yeah. I would be too happy to answer. Uh, maybe I will start by. Uh, I actually I have a, a general. Uh, first of all, I, I begin by a general question about uh, because first, uh, first of all, uh, you have said that there are uh, many ways to. Uh, for example, here uh, the quantization uh, is based on the bail transform, and. Uh, yes. I am also. I am only uh, asking about if we have uh, many. Uh, and now, and now with this uh, transformation, we have uh, showed, for example, uh, some results about, um, uh, for example, the result about uh, the veil transform uh, to uh, link this. Of if I understood uh, right. Yes. The, yes. Sure. The, uh, mm, to the density, to the density. Uh, yes. Uh, and this is based uh, the, on the on the theorem that the, we have some kind of bijection in, in some in, in some sense in in this uh, simplectic. Uh, if we have this condition, uh, these conditions to. Yes. Uh, you talk about the based on, Yeah. Yeah. So now uh, all of these are a mathematical formulation. I, and I, I mean, this kind of, if we uh, took some other, what happens in reality? So it's about, my question is about uh, the philosophy of ontology. What happens in reality if, uh, if we have uh, multiple uh, mathematical uh, formulation in some sense? Yes. Uh, how, how we can answer what happens in uh, reality uh, on the ontology? Yeah. I mean, sure. if you have some comments about uh, this question sure. of sure. Uh, sure. for physicists. Sure. <laughs> no, your question is important, actually, mm. because vibe quantization has been traditionally used by physicists since almost the beginning. Why? Because vibe uh, solved very well this quantization, and it was noted that it has the symplectic covariance property. Uh, physicists would say that, yes, well, it's covariant under, under at least linear uh, uh, symplectic or canonical transformations, as classical mechanics. Good. That's a very good reason, of course. However, however, approximately at the same time, you had Born, Max Born, and Pascual Jordan, two uh, German mathematicians, who created, together with Heisenberg, another way of quantizing. I think they did it even a couple of years before a while. And the Born Jordan quantization is about what was called at that time matrix mechanics. It turns out that their, their arguments are very well motivated. And personally, I think that uh, they made the right quantization uh, choice. And that, you see, also people say, oh, you, have, you have matrix mechanics called the Heisenberg formulation of quantum mechanics and the Schrodinger formulation of quantum mechanics. And then physicists claim, yeah, they are both equivalent. <laughs> They are equivalent only if you use the Bohr-Jordan quantization scheme. I have pointed out that in a couple of papers and also in my book about the Bohr-Jordan quantization. It's false if you, if, you, um, if you do not use the same. If you use, I mean, uh, via quantization for Schrodinger and Bohr-Jordan for Heisenberg. Actually, why do you have this confusion? It's just because it's, both quantizations are practically very difficult to distinguish. For all classical Hamiltonian functions, physical quantum, uh, physical Hamiltonian functions, uh, vibe quantization and Bojolan quantization give the same operators. You cannot distinguish them. You must go to subtle things like the, the squared of the angular momentum, things to, 
to see that you really have it here. For the uh, for the Wigner format, also, uh, it, it turns out that both Jordan quantization is very well motivated by what is called the uh, by what is called the consideration of the Cohen class. That it, it's obtained the the Wigner transform, which corresponds to born Jordan, is obtained from the usual Wigner transform by a convolution with a singular function and so on and so on. So the properties are very close to each other, but the statistical predictions are slightly different. So it's funny that you ask me that because I'm, I've written a paper, it's an archive and we haven't published it yet uh, with colleagues from Gashing. Gashing is a center uh, for quantum mechanics and optics near, near Munich. Yeah. And experiments tend to show that the Bohr Jordan quantization is indeed the right one. But we will try to go a little bit further. But okay, for a mathematician, and most people say that I'm a mathematician and not a physicist, say that, yeah, okay, it's, these are two parts of closely related parts of mathematics. Each of them deserves special attention and deserves to be studied. Physicists, you know, physicists are often, I'm sorry if I offending physicists are often much more categorical. They, they, they alert one thing and they often refuse to, to, uh, to, to, to change their mind. Well, I can understand that as well. But uh, no, well, any, anyway, I mean, it, it's very hard to change the traditions in physics or to, to try to involve new points of view. But your question is very interesting because you have several quantum mechanics which are more or less indistinguishable experimentally, more or less. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I have also a question. Okay, it's uh, it's just the uh, the formulation of when we uh, take the particular example of uh, Gaussian. Uh, yes. The, if it has the Gaussian form. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, I can see some uh, folk space there, but okay, I, I don't know actually if there are, for example, in some. Uh, there space. is no. Yeah, there is no relation to. Of course. Of yeah. course. You can rewrite all this, what I've said about Gaussian, in terms of the uh, folk space. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's just a matter of taste. But everything can be reformulated using that formalism. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I have did I have done it because what well, I can do I don't have time to do everything but yes this is obvious yeah yeah sure okay I just uh okay it was just a, a comment because I think sure. uh, no, no. maybe uh, fox fox uh, fox space can uh, well, no. can uh, mean something to uh, yeah I mean in quantum mechanics I think it's uh, in some uh, beginning book of quantum mechanics, uh, we can use the... Sure, sure. And, and quantum opticians are using very much the open space uh, representation and then uh, all these things. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I'm, I'm more or less using the language and, term, and uh, symbolism of harmonic analysis because I'm mainly working in harmonic analysis. But uh, of course you can shift over to other, other formulations as well, yeah. I'm not so sure if there, there are uh, other questions. Is there uh, any other question? So uh, if not, uh, uh, I thank you a lot, uh, Professor, to for well, accepting uh, coming and also for the, the interesting talk. In any case, the talk is recorded and it will be Ah. Uh, I think of uh, of usefulness for other people. It will it will be uh, uploaded okay. on YouTube. Ah, okay, fine, fine. Mm. Please please notify me when it's done. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, I will I will send the link and uh, yes. Okay, okay. I want to thank very much the organizer and you as well. Um, yeah, I thank you. A pleasant day. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. And uh, next time, I wish uh, we can. Because uh, you have said that uh, it would be better if we can meet in, in, in person, and I hope in uh, I hope. The, some yeah the next semester we could organize something, and uh, yeah we sure. can 
uh, organize something in person. With Better great than pleasure. Just with, <laughs> with great pleasure. Awesome. Yes. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you all for attending. <laughs> Have a good day. Good day. Bye. 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 Bye.